Welcome to the Bulwark Podcast. I'm Charlie Sykes. Okay, so I'm going to confess that even though it's been a day now, I'm still kind of obsessed with what happened with the San Francisco school board recall election. I, and I know that that's like one city's recall election, but I just think it has national resonance. And uh, so I, I, that's what I wanted to talk about. At least I wanted to start off today talking uh, about that with Karen Tumulty, who is the Washington Post deputy editorial page editor and columnist. Huayna was also interested in this, right? Absolutely. I mean, look, San Francisco is... It is as liberal a major city as you could possibly find outside of Madison, Wisconsin, maybe Berkeley, Wisconsin. I don't know. The vote on Tuesday night was more than 70 percent to recall to throw out of office the super uber woke members of the San Francisco school board. So it was sort of like the progressive left versus the extreme progressive left. And it was it was a stomping. Oh, absolutely. And it was the first time since something like 1983 that this had happened. In, you know, in San Francisco. So I, th- I, I don't think this is just an isolated happenstance. I mean, granted, this particular school board had, had really kind of gone bonkers, but um, <laughs> I, I think it speaks to a, a larger thing that we're seeing across the country. Okay, well, let's talk about you know the the specific issues in San Francisco. They they kept the schools closed for a long time. Obviously, that's uh, that's not possible. They also uh, they spent their time doing all sorts of things that I think struck voters as maybe not the priority. This uh, decision to paint over murals at George Washington High School because George Washington apparently was too polarized, and and then they voted to rename forty four schools. Um, some, something based on completely shoddy research, but it was like, we are going to uh, whitewash American history or the opposite. I don't know. And then apparently also one of the hot button issues, they voted to remove merit-based entrance exams. So, you know, I, it does strike me that there's kind of a, a, a lesson for national progressives that there's a limited appetite for some of this stuff, even among reliably Democratic voters. In San Francisco, I think Joe Biden got more than 80 percent of the vote. And so this is not closet Republicans that revolted, is it? I mean, this is this is not some right wing plot to overthrow the school board. Yeah. And it, it's just that in the middle of a pandemic, when people are very, very worried about their children's well-being and their, you know, the fact that they are losing out in their key years when it comes to education, that this school board would wrap itself around the axle on renaming schools and punishing Diane Feinstein for things that she did while she was mayor. Uh, it just it just really spoke to misplaced priorities that were just not at all in line with what parents had elected these people to do. You know, and I and I This is like the second consecutive day we talked about this on the podcast. I was talking about it with Gary Kasparov, who actually brought it up himself. You know, we're we're talking about Ukraine and Russia. And he he saw the vote in San Francisco as a positive development, maybe an indication that that there was some common ground that Americans weren't going to go along with constantly rewriting and degrading their history. So he actually saw it as a positive sign. I, I, I think you can look at it as a positive sign. Yeah. But also... I mean, there's something going on in some of these urban areas that's that's interesting. I mean, there's a, a recall campaign against the very, very progressive district attorney as well, who's been one of these, you know, racial equity over public safety figures. And, you know, for the first time this week, I'm thinking that may succeed as well. I mean, so there is a revolt of progressives against progressives in Wokistan. And I also think that there's a lot going on in California right now that is really worth keeping an eye on. Gavin Newsom in September handily beat back a recall effort, but you're seeing his polling numbers now are under 50. You are seeing Californians' concerns about crime. The LA Times had a a poll over the weekend. Back in 2014, uh, California had passed a constitutional amendment really raising the level of property crimes that constitute a felony. Now, with the smash and grabs that people are seeing, something like 70-something percent now say, nope, let's let's bring those numbers down again. Let's let's start, let's start charging these people with felonies. Uh, people believe that Newsom mm. has 
done a terrible job on dealing with the homeless problem. And so many times in modern history, we have seen social movements come out of California and big, big political trends coming out of California. If, if this is how the electorate is feeling right now in an election year, I, I don't think California is going to turn red or purple, but I think this is a real warning sign for Democrats nationally. That's an interesting point that all of these reform movements come out of California. Maybe this year you're going to see the counter revolution also come out of uh, California. So what do Democrats do about it? I mean, obviously there are red lights flashing all over the place. Uh, I'm sure you saw the piece in Politico yesterday that Democrats have these internal polls, internal research showing that in uh, battleground states, the voters think the party's preachy, judgmental, and focused on culture wars. And the campaign arm of the House Democrats are warning them that uh, uh, unless they uh, somehow confront the GOP's, and this is their term, alarmingly potent culture war attacks from critical race theory to defunding police, they risk losing significant grounds to Republicans in the midterm. So, for example, this is how bad it is. Republicans lead the generic ballot in the battleground states by about four points. And again, this this comes from the Democrats themselves, that if they don't answer Republican hits on culture war issues, the lead goes from four points to 14 points. So again, what are Democrats going to do about this? Because right now they, they seem to be on the defensive on every one of these issues, whether it's the border, whether it's crime. They just don't seem to have figured out how to, I'm sorry to use the term message, but how, how to turn this dynamic around. Can they? And what do they need to do? Well, I think the first thing they need to do is quit telling themselves that this is just something being ginned up by Fox News. Yeah. Um, I think they need to start listening to voters, to, you know, not just Republican voters, but but independents and, and even some of their own Democratic base on issues like crime, inflation, where people are upset. And the Demo- again, just sort of dismissing this as ginned up culture war issues by the Republicans isn't going to cut it. You know, it's interesting when I say things like that, people say, well, you just want the Democrats to be more like Republicans. And and my response is, no, no, I think the Democrats should be more like Democrats that actually win elections. People like Eric Adams or centrists like Connor Lamb and Abigail Spanberger, who figured out how to do this, John Tester, who's figured out how to win in Montana. There are lots of Democrats But unfortunately, there's been a reluctance to really take on the people who are out there going, damn right, we want to defund the police. Corey Bush. Yeah, I'm going to keep talking about defunding the police. This is uh, this is toxic stuff. And I don't know whether or not they have the time to turn it around. Um, well, you know, fortunately for them, they, they are running against the Republicans. And of course, we're also getting daily more and more evidence of how this has become a Republican Party that is willing to smash every conceivable norm. And who knows, we're, we're going to start March 1st, we're going to start the primary season, uh, especially on the Republican side, we're seeing more primary challenges than we have ever seen before. If the Republicans put a bunch of extremists on the ballot, that that could also help the Democrats. It, it, well, it, it could. And also there are there are signs that the the civil war and I, I put an asterisk behind that because that civil war is kind of over. But but the, but the internal fighting on among Republicans is getting more intense So in my home state of Wisconsin. Uh, we have the the establishment Republicans who have really, you know, done done everything they possibly can to appease Donald Trump, uh, to you know, gin up uh, fake investigations into the election. I mean, they are they 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 may not be complete MAGA verse people, but uh, they're they're certainly willing to bow the knee to you know fly down and kiss the ring in, in, at Mar-a-Lago. But that's not enough. Uh, you know, Trump is 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 upping the ante almost every single day. So yesterday. Actually, the day before yesterday, uh, you had two Republican legislators at the Capitol uh, leading a rally, calling for not, not not just pushing the big lie, but proposing and insisting that Wisconsin rescind its 10 electoral votes, actually take back the 10 electoral votes from 2020. And one of the guys who's pushing that is running for governor 
and, you know, has sort of the tacit endorsement of Trump himself, who's been calling him and talking to him and encouraging him. Mike Lindell came to Wisconsin to endorse this guy, the rescind the electoral vote guy. So the window keeps moving and the ante keeps going up and up and up. And so a lot of the energy in Republican politics right now has been turned into attacks on one another, which is is interesting that, that among Democrats, if you really want to get Democrats passionate, you start talking about Joe Manchin or Kirsten Cinema, And if you want to get Republicans really cranked up, you talk about, you know, rhinos like Doug Ducey or, you know, Robin Voss, who's the Speaker of the Assembly in Wisconsin. So both parties seem intent on ripping themselves apart, at least at the moment. Yeah, I'm, I will be really interested in seeing how aggressive the Republican establishment is willing to get. I mean, the New York Times had this big piece earlier this week on efforts by everybody, you know, from the Bushes to a lot of governors to talk Doug Ducey into running Mm -hmm. for the Senate. I mean, that, if that happens, that pokes the bear in Mar-a-Lago. And um, very much. So it's, you know, it's one thing to sort of talk a good game, but if they actually put some people on the ballot and really are willing to stand up to Trump like that, it'll be a little more impressive. Well, I know it seems like uh, ancient history now, but uh, your your last column was about the, the RNC's pratfall when they passed the resolution, obviously at Trump's bidding, to censure Adam Kinzinger and Liz Cheney. And then along the way, seem to proclaim that the January 6th rioters were engaging in legitimate political discourse. That was another one of those indications that at the moment when the Republican Party should be focusing on the future, talking about the issues that will determine the 2022 election, they are just absolutely stuck in the past and all in on basically doing whatever Donald Trump wants. I mean, they don't have a platform or anything, right? They just stand for one thing, just one thing. And they're prepared to just go to the wall on that one thing. And they're also, as with Trump himself, I mean, they are just shrinking their base. I mean, they are not doing anything to to reach out to voters who might be undecided, might be up for grabs. It is just remarkable to me. I mean, any of us who who were old enough to remember Reince Priebus and his uh, his great oh, yeah. autopsy after the 2012 election when they decided that the future of the Republican Party was being more inclusive and reaching out to more young people and women and, and you know, Hispanics. And now it just seems like all they want to do is live inside their echo chamber. It's true. You know, you got me thinking about that because, you know, back then, I think Republicans along with Democrats thought that the demographics were history and it was going to be this sort of, there would be a wave that would go across the country that that really hasn't happened because I think Democrats proved they were a little bit softer among working class African Americans and Hispanics. But, you know, it, 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 it occurs to me though, and, and, and I'm, I'm thinking of this because on the fly, so cut me a little bit slack, slack because this is not completely digested. There's a passion gap, an enthusiasm gap between Republicans and Democratic voters. That's been documented. That's been talked about. But maybe you can explain why there's a passion gap on some of these social and cultural issues as well. You know, for example, we are on the precipice of having the Supreme Court overturn Roe versus Wade. In Florida, the legislature is poised to pass a don't say gay kind of bill. And I just don't see the left progressives being, you would normally expect they'd be hair on fire about this stuff, but I don't sense the path. Am I, am I just missing it? Or is there kind of a, like people keep their heads down and what they're waiting to be indignant and outraged later? Um, do you know, do you know what I'm, I'm getting at? I mean, I sense the right is passionate. They're out there they're on the streets, they're doing things. And yet you would think that this would be the moment where you would have, where's the women's marches? Where is the, where's the sense that the right is, they're, they're burning books. They're, I mean, they're burning books. They're censoring teachers. They're banning, you know, discussions of homosexuals. They're about to take away a right to abortion. Where's the, where's the pushback? Well, on abortion, going all the way back to Roe versus Wade in 73, when people are single issue voters on abortion, they have always been on the anti-abortion side. And if you talk to pollsters and if you listen to focus groups, which I have, 
there's a couple of things you hear from Democratic and lean Democratic voters. And one is just the sheer exhaustion they feel after the Trump years. They just don't want to think about politics. They, they, They feel like Trump is gone. They've got a lot of things going on in their lives, and they are just tired. And then the second thing you hear, and I've heard this over and over, is this sense that somehow this is all not really happening. You know, oh, that's just Texas. Oh, that's huh. just Mississippi. That won't happen here. Um, and so I, I think those two things, it's not, it is a passion gap, but it is true. I mean, it's one side just feeling completely disengaged, I think. And that is a big, big problem for Democrats if they can't get their voters and specifically what pollsters call surge voters to the polls, the kind of, say, young people who showed up in 2018 and hadn't really shown up before. And they've they've got a real problem with those voters. So feel free to disagree with me about this. I Every poll I've seen would, would suggest that voters are l- less interested in January 6th than pundit class, of which I am a member because I am still extremely focused on January 6th. I'm going to confess that. But let's talk about the latest developments, the legal developments, and whether they're going anywhere uh, in terms of, of Donald Trump. Because again, I feel like we've been here before again and again and again. There there are some great super cuts. I don't know if you've seen these reels of all of the talking heads on cable television saying, the walls are closing in, the walls are closing in, the walls are closing in on on Donald Trump. And of course, it never happens. I mean, the, the Mueller investigation, this was it. This was going to be the one, you know, he's going to be arrested and none of it ever happens. But having said all of that, let's put it in, in some context. Now, we are having criminal and civil investigations that are moving ahead. Uh, you, do have, you did have his uh, accounting firm quitting, saying, yeah, you know, all of those uh, those numbers that we gave you about the financial health of the Trump uh, Trump organization. Forget it. Don't use those anymore. They're clearly cooperating. So give me yeah, your sense. By the way, they just yeah. figured this out after 10 years. I mean, what, remind <laughs> remind me not to hire that financial accounting firm. It, it is interesting, this whole question of, yeah, you're supposed to be auditing this. And it, I, I feel like this is kind of an old story that we find out that that these uh, these auditing firms, uh, that when it comes to certain clients, kind of I don't know, you know, put their finger on the scale a little bit. But so, I, okay, so give me your sense of where we're at. The January sixth committee is moving ahead at I would say ramming speed. Um, not clear whether that's ever going to get to Donald Trump. The Department of Justice appears to be completely uninterested in going after Trump. You have the New York investigation. You have the Atlanta investigation. What do you think? So where, where do you think we're at? What, 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 uh, what, what are you keeping your eye on? And what do you think the prospects are that anything will come of any of these things? I'm still skeptical. And, you know, you you now have all these revelations this week about Trump destroying documents, you know, Maggie Haberman, he was shoving them into the toilet. Did he break the law? It's pretty clear that he did, but you're just not going to haul a former president into court over the Presidential Records Act. Um, And by the way, that's a kind of hard thing to prosecute. You have to prove that he knew what he was doing, that that he, you know, you have to prove a lot of things that are just going to be impossible to prove about it. Did he destroy documents? Yes. But you have to prove intent, you know, and that's going to be a hard thing to do. It it is. And I I, I think the chances are pretty slim that there will actually be any legal action, which once again, you know, raises the question, what's the point of having a law if you don't enforce it? And how many of our laws are based on the the honor system? But, you know, I was thinking about this and I, I, I'm not among those who wakes up every day wanting to beat up on Merrick Garland because they haven't indicted Trump. But on the other hand, I guess I was waiting to go on one of the segments on uh, one of the cable shows and uh, there was a congressman, a Democratic congressman whose name escapes me at the moment. And he was talking about, you know, the lesson that he thought the country had learned after Watergate, which was the president was not above the law, that we didn't want to have a situation where the president was in the position of saying, I will tell you what's legal and what's not legal. You know, uh, if, if I do it, it's not it's not breaking the law. And I started thinking about the difference between Watergate then and now. And you go back and you look at Watergate. 
40 Nixon administration officials were indicted or jailed, 40 of them. H.R. Haldeman, John Ehrlichman from the White House staff resigned, were subsequently jailed. The White House counsel, John Dean, was jailed. John Mitchell, the attorney general, was jailed. Charles Colson, special counsel to the president, went to prison. James McCord went to prison. So, and of course, the president was forced to resign. There was significant legal accountability for people throughout the administration. And the contrast between then and now is really striking. Now, the biggest difference, of course, is that there was, what, a special counsel, special investigator back then who was independent. But remember, all of these people were charged and and imprisoned when Republicans control the Department of Justice. So this whole hands-off thing is is really a dramatic contrast to what we had back in the 1970s, isn't it? But I think you put your finger on it. That was also a time when the president's own party was not willing to not only excuse anything he did, but to essentially form a a Praetorian guard around him to protect him. And that, I think, is the difference now. Uh, I think that's true. I also think it's the lack of an independent counsel. If uh, the Biden folks had come in and said, we don't want to make this a partisan witch hunt, we're going to name an independent counsel. If you had a Leon Jaworski-like figure, things might be different. But but obviously, the, the politics is different as well. Okay, so speaking of uh, politics, I saw that you had tweeted out a fascinating story from uh, the New Republic magazine about one of the new phenomena of, of fundraising. And it's about uh, focus on the Amy McGrath uh, Senate race. Amy McGrath, of course, was the great Democratic hope to run against Mitch McConnell raised a gazillion dollars and then just got totally blown out. And this is, is this her campaign director writes who talks about this? Where it's one of her top aides, right? Right, right. And so, so tell me the story and what, and, and, and what makes this so interesting. Well, so what you saw in Kentucky was that, you know, Amy McGrath, however appealing she was, never had a ghost of a chance against Mitch McConnell. But, um, you know, some well-placed ad buys on the Rachel Maddow show and elsewhere kind of convinced a lot of Democratic donors who do not live in Kentucky and know nothing about the politics of Kentucky to just essentially start deluging her campaign with money. And what happens when you do that around political consultants is they figure out ways to spend the money, often ways to spend the money that enrich themselves. And so essentially all of this money, which, by the way, could have gone into other races where, where candidates had chances of winning, it was just wasted. And I'm a Texan and I I cannot count the number of election cycles where Democratic consultants have gone out and convinced donors in New York and California that somehow Texas is in play. Texas is <laughs> about to Texas is about to turn if you just send your money to me. And of course, I- anybody who lives in the state knows that you know Wendy Davis never had a chance against Greg Abbott, and Beto O'Rourke came closer than most people thought he would, but but he too was, was not going to win that race. And so I just think that if somebody needs to, as, you know, well-intentioned people across the country are trying to figure out where to send their hard-earned dollars to, to do some candidates some good, uh, they need to stop listening to the bedtime stories that they are being told on social media and, you know, that are coming in their email boxes and, and that sort of thing. It, it, this story, and I really do recommend it, was such a look behind the curtain of how money gets spent in campaign, how it gets wasted in campaigns. Yeah, the losing Democrats who gobbled up money and and it talks about Amy McGrath, but also other Senate candidates who really, in effect, deceived donors to rake in far more cash than their Republican opponent, but got crushed. Yeah, the same thing happened in Maine in well, Susan right. Collins's race. 
it was Amy McGrath's own campaign manager who's quoted in this article. I was trying to remember what, what his position was. Um, and his quote, he calls it an incestuous fucking orgy of money. Um, but also it, it, the, the point of, of how it distorts things, because I remember seeing this from Wisconsin as well. There was a guy uh, running, I think, for Paul Ryan's old congressional seat, and he was an Internet troll who went by the name Iron Stash. And anyone around here knew that this guy was not going to win all kinds of baggage. I mean, a terrible candidate, but comes up with a 60 second ad that's then aired on MSNBC and brings in all of the outside money. And it's like, wait, guys, this is not going to be happening here. And, and that was the phenomenon. That's been the phenomenon of the last several cycles where these local races become nationalized in, 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 in a way that not only sucks out resources from other winnable races, but also then, you know, drives out potentially more competitive candidates because they aren't the designated one. And I wonder whether that's going to happen, you know, in our Senate race here in Wisconsin. I, I just, uh, I just don't know. I mean, again, it's a, it's not Amy McGrath's fault that she became the designated person, but you look at the numbers now and you go, oh, that was just, it, it's almost the definition of insanity. By the way, speaking of the definition of insanity, do you know this is my segue into Sarah Palin? That, you know, what a weird saga. I, I thought we were done with Sarah Palin, but apparently we're not. She loses her lawsuit against the New York Times. But uh, this is not over, is it? I mean, there's going to be an ongoing attempt from people to water down the law of libel that has protected the media since the 1960s. So give me your take on that case. Well, I mean, what came out in this trial, which looked like some sloppiness, a lot of sloppiness on deadline on the part of the New York Times, it didn't make the paper look good, but it also was easily well within the Times versus Sullivan standards of libel laws when you're dealing with a public figure, that there has to be reckless disregard for the truth and not just sloppiness. So it was pretty clear that Sarah Palin was not going to win this lawsuit. By the way, she is going to appeal um, the suit. But what I didn't understand was why the judge felt it was necessary, even as the jury was deliberating, why the judge felt it was necessary to announce that, oh, by the way, and I'm going to throw this case out anyway. Well, I mean, it, it's and that's that become very messy now that several jurors are saying that they received push notifications on their phones telling them that the judge had just tossed the case out. Yeah, so oh, all this uh. is going to do, this is going <laughs> to, uh, you know, just play into what I'm sure is going to be a right-wing narrative about the the deep state and their media enablers. Well, you mentioned that this uh, exposed some problems in the New York Times, and I, uh, for people who have not been following this case, they were writing about political violence and threw in a, a line about, you know, Sarah Palin's connection to the shooting of Gabby Giffords uh, down in uh, Arizona, a long and many, many time debunked linkage because there had been a super PAC, but it had a, a site over the district or something. It was ridiculous. If, if the New York Times editorial board had not been the hermetically sealed bubble that it was, I don't think this would have happened. Because I think that almost anyone who had been paying attention to that particular controversy would have immediately said, yeah, you don't want to put that in the editorial. <laughs> you just don't. They, 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 they recognized it very quickly and they did fix it. But it's one of the indications that I think put them at a great deal of risk. But also, I do think that the momentum to challenge this, or at least two Supreme Court justices that want to change the standard of reckless malice, the public opinion polls would suggest a lot of hostility to the media these days. So I do think that there's a, a long-term danger in this country to seeing the you know, rather significant revision of the libel laws that would make it uh, much easier to harass members of the media or media outlets for writing things that uh, public officials and politicians don't like. And, and of course, you know, Times versus Sullivan, the uh, Supreme Court upon which all of this is based, it, it, it was, came about long, long, long before the invention of the Internet. And so I also think there is, you know, it, it is no longer the case that a few big newspapers and television networks kind of uh, 
that determines our national conversation. And also, if one newspaper makes a mistake, corrects it, by then the incorrect information is out and it's all over and it's spreading. So I can understand why you might be able to argue that perhaps the the standards that were written many, many decades ago are worth looking at again. Well, I also saw a little detail in one of the Slate magazine reports that I thought was awfully interesting. You know, for people who are wondering, well, what's the worst that could happen from the media point of view? Well, remember the story of Gawker when Hulk Hogan effectively put it out of business by, you know, launching a, a major lawsuit that that uh, the bankrupted it. The attorney who handled that lawsuit apparently sat through the entire Sarah Palin versus New York Times lawsuit. And the Slate magazine reporter went up to him and said, what, what are you doing here? You're writing an article, you're writing a book. And the guy's, no, no, I'm just taking notes. I'm just learning. So um, the, 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 the possibility here is not, is not just that you can win lawsuits. It's also that you can simply destroy outlets by the legal costs. And look, imagine a world in which Donald Trump or Donald Trump's acolytes could sue a media outlet for, you know, any time they, they publish something that they didn't like, uh, fake news. What if they just flooded the zone with lawsuits, many even frivolous lawsuits that wouldn't be immediately dismissed under Times versus Sullivan, but kept the meters running? Um, then I, to tell you the truth, that's really conceivable to me. Oh, absolutely. And of course, Trump, I mean, is frivolous lawsuits. I mean, that is practically his middle name. I know. It's like it's a, this is his wheelhouse, which is why he's been pushing for it. So thoughts on where we're at with Ukraine, whether you think the Biden administration has done a sufficiently good job in deterring Vladimir Putin. What do you think? I think that, yeah, I think they have generally done a good job of rallying the Western allies and essentially cornering Putin here. Now, you know, again, we we don't know how all of this is going to unspool, but it is a reminder of how important these alliances are and how important it is to rebuild them and protect them. Because in the current situation in the world, where we are seeing authoritarians rise in, in all sorts of places, they really are our, our very best protection. And of course, Donald Trump was America first, America only. I do think that, that Biden has done a good job of, of kind of rebuilding a lot of those relationships. Yeah, that could certainly be one of the more unexpected developments. If, in fact, you do strengthen those alliances, if that happens, it's it's unclear to me where it's going. So one other issue I wanted to get your take on, though, the COVID wars continue, but they seem to have taken a very interesting turn where you have even the blue state governors that are dropping the mask mandates. I, I think the politics seems to have changed rather rather dramatically in the last, it feels like two or three weeks where even Democrats, uh, even the administration is going, okay, the public just is done with this. it. Even though we continue to have more than 2,000 deaths a day, the public is done with it. We're dropping the mask mandates. They're falling, even including in D.C., White House officials saying today the U.S. is approaching a phase where COVID isn't a crisis. Where do you think we're at on all of this? Uh, is it time to get back to normal? Is it time to basically say we have to learn to live with this, or is it premature? What do you What do you think? You're right there in Ground Zero in Virginia and D.C. I think people are sick of it, and that's quite understandable. But I really hope that I mean. Late last spring, last summer, we had thought we were done with it then too. So if Omicron is receding, we've got a little bit of breathing room. Um, I hope that people will think beyond, is this just the time for me to take off my mask? And into what should we be doing about vaccines? And especially how can we get kids under five vaccinated? It's quite worrisome that there's you know, daily seems to be more and more evidence of the declining efficacy of the vaccines we have. And one thing we know is that there's going to be another variant around the corner. It may be 
more lethal, it may be less lethal, it may be more transmissible or less transmissible. But I do hope that people will not only breathe a, a sigh of relief, but also support kind of looking around the corner and don't just say, you know, oh, we're going to live with this because what we'll be living with is whatever the next variant is. So let's take advantage of this time to to do some things to prepare for it. The messaging out of the Biden White House appears to be all over the place. I don't even know what their main message is any longer. You know, as, as you point out, some of it's because things are changing. The science seems to be evolving. The politics are evolving. So what exactly is the Biden administration's overall message right now? They they seem to have kind of given up on the vax mandates. They are not as popular as they used to be. They're not willing to go as far as some of the Democratic governors have gone. So if you had to sum it up in one sentence, what would it be? I can't come up with one. I'm sorry. I <laughs> Well, it's really confusing for yeah. people in states like New Jersey. It's like, should I be listening to my governor or yeah. listening to the CDC? It's clear that the CDC is kind of rethinking its own standards. It's also pretty clear that those standards ought to be very much based on where you are and what the hospitalization rates are, where you are, and the new cases. Because, you know, what is good for one part of the country at one point in time is not necessarily applicable in another. So I think what people would like are some kind of like real guideposts, real guidelines of what to be looking for in my area, when I'm trying to decide, do we need to put the masks back on? Do we you know, need to put more measures in? Because it's very clear that having a national standard just doesn't work anymore. It can't work. And whatever they come up with, uh, I, I think it's pretty clear that we're never going to go back to mandatory uh, masking in schools, again, or at least on a large scale. That, that, that seems to... I, I just think that the the backlash has been so great, and I'm, I, I see that the new law that will require Virginia public schools to make masks optional by March 1st has just been signed by the governor there. I mean, that was a huge issue in, in Virginia. So, uh, you know, what's driving this, politics or science right now? Um, I, think, I think it's both. But it's also, you know, then let's figure out a way to get small children vaccinated. And, then, and by the way, a a whole bunch of people are also looking at having to return to their offices. Yeah. And that's going to be a whole nother shift. I mean, we at the Post are supposed to be back three days a week in the middle of March. That's also going to be a big, big, big adjustment. And parents of small children and people who live in households where people are immune compromised are nervous about this, and they should be. And there's a whole other segment of the population that's been working remotely and kind of likes it. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm in that group. So one of my longer term concerns, though, is this anti-vax movement, which has gone from being fringe to being a larger fringe, but that it seems to be spilling over into anti-vaccination, anti-immunizations for a lot of other things as well. So a, a pandemic that should have encouraged people to be more respectful of the science, I think one of the bits of fallout will be that we now have tens of millions of Americans that not only refuse to be vaccinated for the pandemic, but m might be skeptical or refuse to be vaccinated or Im immunized for a whole series of other diseases. So, well, there's there's a dark moment to end on, I guess. Oh, wait, there's another dark moment too, which is, <laughs> and here the airlines want to be able to start banning people yeah. who have misbehaved on the planes, you know, people who have to to protest have gotten up and tried to open the emergency yeah. exits <laughs> mid-flight. Right. Yeah. And we have, what is it, something like eight Republican senators saying these people shouldn't be treated like terrorists? Well, okay, they don't have to be treated like a terrorist. You just, you can't fly anymore. You behave like that on an airplane. You should be banned from flying. I don't know how this became, you know, being a drunken idiot on a flight now became we need to stand up for your civil liberties. No, I don't want you on my plane anymore. Right. It is. And, it is you know. and also the original no-fly list that were put into place after 9-11 had some real problems, but they were trying to predict how people were going to behave based on travel patterns or whatever. In this case, these are people who have 
actually misbehaved on airplanes, who have knocked out flight attendants' teeth, who have you know, been incredibly disruptive. This is not trying to guess whether they will be, so, but somehow they, they should have their civil rights, or at least their civil rights as they are envisioned by grandstanding Republican senators protected. <laughs> I'm not sure that this is a particularly smart political move for them because my sense is based on my extensive viewing of social media is that when people behave like jerks and they're thrown off the plane, that the vast majority of the other passengers are going, yeah, yeah, throw them off, get them out of here. They're, they're not going, this is terrible that you're taking this drunken woman who is trying to open the door out of the plane. You know, can I call her a lawyer? That's not, that does not seem to be the sentiment. So Karen Tumult, is there anything else that, that we should be keeping our eye on? Anything that you're, that you're thinking about over the next week? Well, I do think these inflation numbers, you know, they just keep ticking up and up and up and up. And the Fed's going to have an opportunity in the next few weeks to show they're serious about doing something about it. And uh, this is one of the many things that you cannot say is just kind of an imaginary thing. Everybody who goes to the grocery store or or gets their annual notice of their rents, they're feeling it. And to, to try and deny that this is happening, I think could be really toxic for people in power. I think you're right. I mean, there's a real disconnect because people in the real world have been experiencing this for some time. So there's no denying it. But I think one of the more alarming things of this week was the indication that folks in, in D.C. and particularly in the Democrats don't have any good ideas when they start floating ideas like a gas tax holiday, which has always been a dumb gimmick. I mean, it's oh, yeah. always been, I'm sorry, it's just a silly, dumb gimmick that would get them no political points whatsoever. And this is floated every time something like this happens. And it's floated by people who are basically signaling, yeah, I'm out of ideas. I'm out of material. I have nothing. I'm just going to go. Remember when oh, I, I think this this came up back in 2008 and, and Barack Obama said, yeah, I'm not I'm not going to pander. I'm not going to go along with this kind of nonsense. And, you know, at least in the distant mists of time, he was given credit for that. But now who knows what's going to happen? Yeah, that and the strategic petroleum reserve. Yes, exactly. Team. They are. They they are kind of the signal like, yeah, I, I got I got nothing. Let's go back. Anybody got anything there? Well, we could always do the gas tax holiday or the petroleum. Ah, oh, come on. You must no, that's all I got. Karen Tumblety, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. I appreciate it very much. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. And thank you all for listening to today's Bulwark Podcast. I'm Charlie Sykes. We'll be back tomorrow and we'll do this all over again.